So this video will be covering chapter 11, section 1, which deals with gases and pressure. Now, pressure is simply given by the formula force per unit area. And it's very easy to see how gases at a certain temperature uh, exert a pressure. Let's say you have a tire, and within that tire you put a bunch of little air molecules. Now, if you'll remember, each of these molecules has a speed. That's part of the kinetic molecular theory. So if we look closely at the wall of the tire, you can see that at any given point, there's going to be a bunch of molecules that have their velocity vectors pointing towards the wall. So they're going to eventually hit the wall, and the wall is going to give them a push back. But because for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, that push back from the wall means that a force is exerted on the wall oppositely. So for any given part of the wall, a certain number of molecules are hitting it and exerting a force at any given time. And that's why gases exert pressure according to this force per unit area formula. Now just to be clear, for this course we're going to be using the standard international units for uh, force, area, and pressure. And for force, that standard unit is the Newton which is the force required to accelerate one kilogram at one meter per second in some direction. An area is going to be measured in meter squared, which makes sense if you have one meter by one meter, it would naturally make sense that you use a meter square measurement. And finally, the pressure, which is the force over the area, is something called the Pascal. We're also going to be using a unit of pressure called the atmosphere, and that is just the standard atmospheric pressure at sea level. And that is equivalent to 101.3 kilopascals. So now we're going to move on to measuring pressure, which is not as simple as one would think. It didn't happen until the 17th century that we were actually able to measure pressure, thanks to the ingenious idea of a barometer. Now a barometer is simply a device used to measure pressure and the first barometer used a test tube full of liquid mercury. Now an Italian man by the name of Torricelli put this tube of mercury inside a dish of some kind of mercury and then figured out that no matter how long the tube was the mercury would only rise to about 760 millimeters above the uh, level of the mercury outside and this is because this, despite the almost pure vacuum uh, that is above this column of mercury the actual pressure over this whole area of the petri dish only exerts enough force to lift this mercury 760 millimeters at uh, what is known as standardized temperature and pressure that is zero celsius and one atm and this is because mercury is very dense so it has a lot of weight pushing downwards. And the atmospheric pressure, which is forcing the mercury down and then up into the test tube, acting this way, only has enough force to push up 760 millimeters. So you can see then that if there is you know, less pressure and therefore less of a force down on this, forcing molecules up, then the level of the mercury would fall because the weight would take over as the predominant force forcing the mercury to come down. Similarly, if you had an increase in pressure and there was a lot more air pushing down on this mercury, the column would rise higher because it would be able to overcome more weight of this column of mercury and push it to say 770 millimeters or something along those lines. And this was how barometers worked for several hundred years. Now, because barometers acted in this way for such a long time, they had to use this, uh, these millimeters of mercury 
as their standard unit of pressure for a long time. And they eventually figured out that 760 milli millimeters of mercury in a column was about the standardized atmospheric pressure. So about one atmosphere, which we already discussed, which is equivalent to 101.3 kilopascals. And the scientific community was so honored by Tours' invention of the barometer that they decided to also rename a unit of pressure in his honor equivalent to one millimeter of mercury. So this is also all equal to 760 Tour in honor of Torricelli. Now I briefly mentioned what is known as STP earlier, but I'm going to reiterate because it's a very important concept. STP stands for Standard Temperature and Pressure. And you need to know that gases obey certain laws at STP. Most measurements are taken at STP. And this is so that scientists don't constantly have fluctuating measurements and they have to convert their results every time to compare. And STP, the standard temperature and pressure at which most experiments with gas gases operate, is zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, or any of the equivalent units that we have down here. So now we're going to be moving on to what is known as Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. And this was something that was figured out by the same John Dalton, who came up with the plum pudding model of the atom that we discussed in chapters three and four. And what he discovered was that for gases that are a mixture of different elements, for example, within our atmosphere, there is, you know, nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide, each of which exert a different pressure. So what he discovered is if you were to, say, remove the oxygen, carbon dioxide, and all the other gases, the nitrogen would exert its own pressure. And he figured out that the sum of each of these pressures given off by the individual gases, when you added them all together, was the total pressure. So in other words, the total pressure is simply the sum of the partial pressures of a gas. So our atmospheric pressure that we feel every day is the sum of the pressure of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, all the other trace gases in our atmosphere. Now this law, though it may seem somewhat obvious, is in fact very useful for experimentation. For instance, most gases are collected through some sort of tube apparatus that feeds into a bottle or flask or something that is already filled with water. And then the gas you're collecting from some flask over here runs through the tube and then bubbles up to fill up what was once an empty space above the water. Now, the problem with this method is that within this gas mixture, there is your desired gas, but as well, there is some water vapor. And if you want to know, say, the pressure of the gas you're making, you have to be able to remove, or at least uh, remove from your calculations, the pressure from the water. So what you would do is you would take the stand the total pressure, which would be atmospheric pressure, if you were to set this in a pool of water where the water was at equal height, and then you would subtract, or first you would take the total and set it up so that you have, you know, the pressure of gas X plus the pressure from the water vapor, and then what you would do is just using some algebra, you would find the pressure of the unknown gas by subtracting the pressure of the water from the atmospheric pressure. And that is how they determine individual gas pressures by using Dalton's law of partial pressures.